All right, so think back to yesterday. We started out the conference by looking backwards. We heard the origin story of POS. You saw our three co-founders sitting here on these cool black chairs. Now we've moved forward through the conference. You've learned lots of new things. You've got some new ideas yourself. And we're now going to think into the future, prospect into the future. And look, we've moved up the chairs. We've got the <laughs> high, uh, high bar stools. But before I introduce our panelists and invite them up, I want you to take a moment and reflect on the question, an emerging research agenda for POS. I think we've heard traces of what that research agenda should be, could be. And I'd like you to just reflect, maybe take out your program, write a couple lines. What does it mean for you going forward? So what do you take away from this that um, you want to include in your research agenda going forward related to POS? Is it something about a methodology that you got interested in? Is it something about uh, a new theory? Is it something about a passion that you saw somebody have that you say, ooh, I'd, I'd be really interested in that context? Um, that, you know, Christy, I think, got us all excited about being in a prison without being in a prison. <laughs> um, but is there something about a context that you'd like to study? So I'm going to give you just one minute to reflect on that before we prime you with our panelists' ideas about a future of, of POS, because we're also going to have some time in this session for, um, for your feedback and responses and, and so forth. So I want you to get your ideas down before we prime you with their ideas. All right, I'm going to pull us back together. Hopefully you'll continue to germinate on some ideas as you hear from our panelists. So um, we have four mid-career folks that we invited to be part of this session. There are many of you out there, mid-career people, that just as easily could have been up here. Um, but we wanted to get people from a range of different backgrounds and interests. I think what's interesting about all four of these folks is that they have an entrepreneurial bent as well as a really impressive scholarly record and also um, amazing teachers. So I'm going to introduce each of them one by one and then invite them to come up together in a moment. Um, so first is Jody hoffer Uh Jody is a professor of management at Brandeis, uh, the Heller School for Social Policy and Management. Um, the thing that's really powerful about Jody, I think, is that her research on relational coordination is not only out there for us as academics to be reading about in top journal articles, but she also created the Relational Coordination Research Collaborative. And you might have noticed if you came in earlier, it was on the screen because they are also a sponsor of this conference. But it's a wonderful organization. It involves a number of people involved with POS, um, which brings scholars and practitioners together to build this relational coordination in many different industries. And so very entrepreneurial. I was also interested to see that Jody is also the chief scientific officer of a, um, a, a company that's related to this called the relational, Coordina relational Coordination Analytics. So really super interesting. Um, secondly is Andrew Knight. Andrew is a professor of organizational behavior at the Olin Business School at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he's also entrepreneurial, but he had some of his entrepreneurial start even before he became a professor. As he was finishing up his PhD at Wharton, he actually uh, was part of a startup, a healthcare analytics um, startup called Pascal Metrics, and it still exists today. Um, and he has a really exciting body of research uh, that's very POS related, especially around creativity um, and group affect, and using a lot of um, very interesting ways to measure 
those things that are t uh, uh, different than just pen and paper kind of surveys, bodily kind of things. So really interesting and entrepreneurial as well. Third on the list is Scott Sunshine. Scott is the Henry Gardner Simmons Professor of Management at Rice University. I will also proudly say he is a graduate of our PhD program and is a really a prolific author on topics related to organizational change, mesoprocesses, and social issues. Um, he, he is the author of Stretch, a best-selling book that came out a couple years ago that takes, out, takes his research and really puts it into the, um, in the realm of practice. And he has a super exciting book that will be coming out in 2020 entitled Joy at Work, The Career-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. Oh my gosh, I can't read. I need that so much, Scott. That sounds great. And it's in conjunction with Marie Kondo, so also very entrepreneurial. And then last but not least is Michael Pearson. Um, Michael is a native of Germany. Um, he's an associate professor at the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University, where he's the program director of the Master of Management program. He's also the former department chair, so he's also had some leadership roles there. Um, he is also entrepreneurial because he is um, one of the co-founders and um, important forces for the International Humanistic Management Association, uh, which has been very active, doing very interesting things over the last few years, and they have a pre-conference at the Academy of Management, and I would really call them a, very much a sister movement to what um, positive organizational scholarship is about. Their aim is to protect dignity and foster well-being. So, as you can see, we have an amazing set of panelists. I'm going to please give them a warm welcome as I invite them up. Okay, so we've got our looking glass here in the, in the visual. And our format for uh, this afternoon is very lively. We want to really end the conference on a bang. Um, so I've asked them to give very brief five-minute opening statements about their perspective, their point of view on the future uh, uh, research agenda for positive organizational scholarship. And then we'll uh, create a little bit of space for them if they have reactions to what they heard from each other. Um, and then I have one opening question for them, and then we're going to open it to your questions or thoughts that you might have on the future uh, research agenda for positive organizational scholarship. So that's our format uh, for our, our, our remaining time together. And so with that, I'm going to ask Andrew to get us started with his opening statement on what he sees as uh, important for the uh, a research agenda for POS going forward. Okay, and I'm going to start off a little weird, I think. Uh, and the punchline statement, I think, for what I see as the future is that the robots are coming. <laughs> uh, now, depending on what popular media you consume, if it's podcasts, documentaries, print media, books, uh, you've no doubt encountered the statement that artificial intelligence is coming to transform the workplace. Uh, there was a recent 60 Minutes episode where some, uh, is an industry insider, uh, predicted that up to 40% of jobs would be replaced by artificial intelligence. Uh, I think if you step back for a moment and you think about what is at the core of positive organizational scholarship, it is probably the one research paradigm that most heavily emphasizes and elevates the importance of humanity in the workplace and humanizing our coworkers. And so what does this look like when our coworkers are algorithms and bots? And what does this look like when we're working side by side with software that's learning our preferences uh, and that's interacting with us and making decisions in conjunction with us? Uh, I think it's a fascinating direction for positive organizational scholarship to go to try to shape, nudge, and influence what the design of that work looks like. We already have a healthy research program that looks at human-computer interaction. And so if you think about that one-to-one -one interaction, uh, and I think a distinct place where positive organizational scholarship can add value is thinking about the interpersonal and organizational ripple effects of the presence of algorithms and bots and artificial intelligence in our workplace. 
Uh, and I think in particular, there are three big buckets of questions where researchers might make meaningful contributions to better understanding what that future of work might look like. Uh, the first is in thinking about the relationship that people have with these forms of artificial intelligence in the workplace. And so some of the tracks uh, over the past two days focused on relationships and high quality relationships uh, at work. What does that look like? Are we able to form high quality uh, relationships and connections with these emerging forms of artificial intelligence that are designed to mimic some of the attributes uh, that make us human? Uh, are we able to use these technologies uh, to ameliorate some of the loneliness that's present within the workplace? And so one is, the first one is just on the interaction between the person and, uh, and the, the, the artificial intelligence. The second big bucket of questions is how the presence of that artificial intelligence influences the human-to-human -human relationships that we have with one another. And so imagine that you're working on a three-person team, but one of the people on your teams is an algorithm. Uh, one of the people on your teams is a Slack bot uh, that is assisting your group in its work. How does that change the nature of your relationship with your human colleague? To what extent do you still defer to that person and trust that person's competence when you're faced with recommendations made by a bot? Uh, the third contribution or, or place where I think POS can make, uh, make a mark is in better understanding the contributions of these algorithms and bots to the culture of groups and organizations. And so if we think about the origins of many of these algorithms, they come from a world where uh, the assumption is maybe the extreme of a Weberian ideal of bureaucracy, where emotions do need to be kept out. And so what does that mean when we have behavioral manifestations uh, and the decisions that are being made by these technologies on a regular and ongoing basis? To what extent do those contributions start to dilute the human component of, uh, of the workplace? So I think if there is one stream where I would be most excited to see POS uh, work go, it would be to not just examine and better understand uh, that new world of work that's emerging, but to start to shape it uh, and help that newer uh, design of the workplace be something that doesn't exploit the humans in the workplace, but actually enriches our lives. So interesting. It makes me think maybe we should have had the robot next to you to give the we next five minute uh, introduction. But it also reminds me of some of the work that uh, Lindsay Cameron was sharing about her work on algorithms. Um, so thank you very much. Michael. Great. Well, I'm the robot. <laughs> <laughs> Yet I, I'm sort of thinking about POS at the species level. So what, what, how, how well are we doing as a species organizing uh, for our own survival and thriving, I don't think we can really say this is, is a great, we're doing a great job. And so the research I think that we might be able to do is like, how can we do a better job? How can we as, a, as humans, at the, not only at the individual level, the group level, the organizational level, but the species level, the humanity level, organize better, more positively? And, and what does that mean? What kind of research questions do we need to ask? What kind of conversations do we need to have? What kind of uh, new approaches do we need? Because I don't think looking backward, trying to understand the past will help us much going forward. Or maybe we need to figure out what and how to parse uh, the kind of insights and knowledge that we might have and understand what can we generate from other sources of knowing. Uh, and, and I think that sometimes is, is not so visible oftentimes here, that where, where are the sources of knowing coming from if we're doing an MTurk study here or something there? How, how much are we able to actually generate insights and wisdom beyond that may, may be able to shift the narrative? And so my, the analogy that I wanted to bring out is a question that I just want to pose. Um, is the operating system that we're running on, the organizational operating system, is can we just fix the bugs? And I'm wondering whether we are part of fixing bugs in the current operating system, or whether we need to design a new one. And I think that some of the conversations that we had, they will say there is a possibility for a new one, but what would it look like? And how can we design it? How can we scale it? Can we leave it in the small places? How can we bring it out to the big places? And how would that work? What are sort of the levels of intervention that, as Donella Meadows would say, that we can shift a system? Because I think, for me, that's sort of what I'm throwing out here is the, the question of how can POS be a system change, <laughs> guide system change, help us with understanding AI 
and all the other challenges that we're facing at the, at the species level at this point. That includes the sustainability, the environmental sustainability conversations that we've heard, the inequality conversations, I think, that, uh, that existed, and many of the other conversations that I think they're all tied together. And I think a defunct uh, ontology, right? What is it that we have as a blueprint of who we are as human beings? And then we say, okay, well, there are the positive deviants, and that's fine, that's wonderful. But are the saints going to save us? Mm -hmm. uh, are there the posit is there enough positive deviance to help us at that level? And I think, to me, that would be a question at what level can we sort of <laughs> normalize upward? I think the, the, the way that uh, Bob and, and Kim were sharing in their session, how can we use some of these insights to, at a societal level, move us more quickly forward towards the kind of potentiality that we have in, in uh, enabling thriving? And, and I think we're, we're not having the conversations. How can POS in this sort of uh, help with that at a societal level also? What are the narratives, the mindsets that we need to reprogram? That's the kind of conversation that I, I think POS can do a lot of research on, can contribute uh, with, and, and that's what I think would be very exciting and meaningful uh, going forward. So just as I listen to you around some of those topics, it feels like the world is ever more ready for POS than ever. Right. And that it isn't a set of band-aids to fix these bugs, but something grander. And we need to be brave right. to think about how to make that happen. And it reminds me, is Christy still here? Christy Rogers. She said, I, so I was just so inspired by the way that you were ending, uh, well, your whole study, but the way you were ending your, um, your study about encouraging us to be brave and helping to give a voice to those that need a voice. And I see some of the examples in, in your research, Christy, about you know, how do we like, rethink the operating system in a prison that humanizes people in a different way. And so, yeah, I, I, I resonate with that too. Jody? Yeah, so I think the real opportunity for PAUSE um, is to continue to and even more embrace productive tensions uh, and not shy away from them. So I'll give a couple of examples um, and they are connected to my work on relational coordination, which is basically coordinating work through relationships of shared goals, shared knowledge and mutual respect, um, supported by structures so that, you know, for scalability. Um, and the first one, the first productive tension that comes to mind um, throughout uh, my, um, you know, the various conversations today is a kind of micro versus macro. Um, a lot of our work, because we're inspired by positive organizational psychology, is relatively micro, but there's also the macro components. And I think um, by embracing them jointly, that we start, we enable ourselves to do something that was just recommended, which is really think about multi-level systems change. Because uh, there are very few changes that are scalable and sustainable if they're not happening and support it at multiple levels simultaneously. We can't just have a policy change and suddenly we have a better world. We've got, and we can't just have individual kind of enlightenment and we have a better world, but all those levels in between, um, and much of it is relational. So the interpersonal relationships are supported by um, uh, changes in practices and structures that we have in a workplace, and then further by uh, changes in our institutional structures. I'll give an example. We've just started doing some work called the Bronx Collaborative Schools Plan in New York City. Basically, uh, a partnership historic between the De New York City Department of Education and the United Federation of Teachers, saying we need a different kind of school culture in order to really meet the needs of kids so that we're not just solving this problem or that, but we're developing collective problem-solving capability and a different way of relating with each other that will transform lives and uh, what can be done. Um, and so that I see happening at this interpersonal level, like how a teacher relates to a student, um, how the teachers relate to each other and administrators and the parents in the community, um, but it's being supported by an institutional partnership between the DOE and the United Federation of Teachers, which there's not been tons of love and partnership mm -hmm. between them. Um, and then, uh, so that kind of, um, the multi-level to sustain and, and um, and scale what could just be these individual transformations, which might not be enough. The positive deviance by itself might not get us where we want to go. Um, a second one is kind of related to that, but it's taking this notion of you know the, the kind of productive tension between personal identity 
and role identity. Um, and some of this really came home to me listening to Christy this morning around respect dynamics um, and uh, the kind of person particularized and the generalized um, uh, changes in, in role identity. And what occurred to me is that in many cases that where I'm working, for example, healthcare organizations, um, it's not, we don't, we could build respect despite one's role. Um, so for example, I've heard surgeons say, I really respect that nurse, because, but as kind of like a, an exception to the rule, mm -hmm. she's really great. Um, but can we transform the role and what it means to be and to respect the role of a nurse? or to be and respect the role of a teacher as opposed to they're fine because somehow they're the exception. So it's transforming not just how we see them as a person, but scaling that then to what it means to really respect these roles that have been underappreciated to our detriment. Um, so somehow not losing sight of the personal, but also uh, connecting that to transforming role relationships. And I do believe that then requires um, uh, transforming structures like how we hire and train and hold people jointly accountable and so on. And I guess the last one that I'll touch upon is um, this very productive tension between uh, our academic research and our practical impact. Mm. Um, and that kind of goes to what Gretchen called us, you know, kind of honored us each for doing. And I do, um, I love kind of being in the ivory tower and also going way beyond it. And I do think that's what Paz is doing um, so well. So I, um, there the example uh, would be some tools that we were just introduced to this afternoon, um, job crafting and reflected best self, and one that uh, we've been working with with great um, you know, success and joy, and that's called relational mapping, whether it's through the survey or just through drawing. Like, How do people come to use these practical tools that are coming out of our research to change the way they think about their jobs, their organizations, um, their networks of organizations, and just see possibilities in a new way um, such that they can um, engage in multi-level systems change. Mm -hmm. So um, those are some productive tensions that I see really helpful for us to um, just grapple with and not shy away from micro, macro, um, personal, and role, and, uh, and finally the academic and the practical. Thank you. Uh uh, I noticed some similarity with Michael around the system change mm -hmm. issue that we need to think big and the macro and the micro. And I really loved your last point about the academic and the practice piece. And I think sometimes like junior people, I think that's what's really impressive about all of you is that sometimes people think, oh, that's what you do in the last part of your career, right? Now that you have a chance to go and make a difference. And you guys have all done that much earlier in your careers. And I think it creates that meaning or task significance that allows us to be resilient, also a source of new ideas, right? I find every time I go in the field, I get a lot more new ideas than I do just picking up AMJ. I mean, I get new ideas there too, but it's a different kind of new um, idea. So I love that. And I, I love that in the conference this year, this afternoon has been all about teaching because that's one maybe really useful first step in thinking about how to make a difference in the world by taking our research and turning it into tools or other ways to share with our students to get out in the world that way. So thank you. Scott. Uh, so the, the way I um, wanted to think about this is um, we, we started off the conference by um, looking at um, the P, the O, and the S. And I was wondering, you know, what, what could our future look like if we think through the, the lens of the, the three uh, keywords that really started off um, you know, this whole body of, of work. So uh, for positive, I was thinking, well, you know, where, where are we and where do we really need to go? And I, I do feel like uh, from what I've, what I've uh, been thinking about, what I've observed over the, the past two days is I do feel like we're at this, this tension in terms of where the, where the narrative for, for positive is. So I think, firstly, I, I, I still feel like we have a lot of definitional work even after 18 years uh, to define, well, what does it really mean to be positive, positive to whom? I mean, I think these were uh, what happens, you know, positive to one group, not positive to another group. Mm -hmm. and these are some of the, the foundational issues that I think we've been struggling with for, for some time. So in, in some respects, 
uh, the future is still somewhat, you know, the, the, the past. And uh, resolving, I think, some of these important conceptual questions that I don't think have been uh, fully resolved. But I think the, the broader question is really fighting for what, what is kind of the, the narr- what I would call maybe the narrative soul of, of the, the positive. And I, we saw different, different versions of what this, what this could be. We started off the conference, uh, Kim was so passionately arguing about wanting to connect uh, what we're doing to uh, profitability and metrics that would really be valued by, by practitioners. And at a, at a business school, how can we not think about uh, performance uh, in terms of profits or something as the ultimate dependent variable? Um, you know, and then you know, there were other, other studies we looked at uh, in, the, in the past two days where you know, well-being, uh, wellness, and, and thriving, and those were the dependent variable. And you know, I think this is tough because I kind of see both, both sides to this question, and it, it's probably an example of a, of a both and. Uh, but I do think that there's a, a word of caution in the, in the former way of thinking about uh, positive, which is in part shaped by uh, what I saw as a very similar debate unfold uh, in the business ethics literature, uh, before I even started as a, as a graduate student, I studied business ethics as an, as an undergraduate, and the same tension was unfolding there, like, you know, the, the thesis that, you know, good, good uh, ethics is good business, and that's the mantra to create legitimacy. But I'm not really sure that that really is what the future of POS is, or, or for that matter, really ought to be. I don't feel like the, the ideas that we're trying to uh, get out there are really contingent on whether or not they connect to profitability. I think uh, normatively uh, they're an end in themselves and that we want to be careful not to get caught into the, the language game that our colleagues in finance or strategy might be playing where uh, they've already elevated that as the ultimate good. I feel like what's so refreshing about POS scholarship and where I feel like the field needs to go is that these are things that should be good in, in, of themselves, where we can help create <coughs> work environments where people can thrive and well-being is important, not so much because of the bottom line, but because it is just important. So I'd encourage uh, research that broadens out dependent variables to look at ways of bringing positivity into uh, people's lives and the community at large. In terms of uh, the O and the organization, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to uh, be more inclusive and expand. And you know, we saw some, some great examples. Uh, we've talked about uh, Christie's paper and thinking about prisons as an you know, unusual side of positivity. I think it's looking for those types of positively deviant cases, unique contexts where we can really see dynamics unfold that we couldn't find in other environments. Now, of course, you know, this, this could happen in a Fortune 100 company, and you know, I'm not saying you know, don't study that. Uh, but I do find that uh, you know, a lot of the more interesting research that seems to be coming out is, is going into contexts where you know, there's all these dynamics and all this life, all, all this stuff that we just have a hard time seeing in other types of places. And I, don't, I wouldn't shy away from picking an exotic context. And I think it's extremely brave, especially in a dissertation, uh, to you know, talk about prisons and then go give a job talk in a bunch of business schools. But you see what the outcome was, right? So I would kind of echo, uh, echo that point in terms of you know, picking contexts that are not just interesting in these deviant cases, but also are important in and of themselves. Uh, and then finally, on the scholarship side, I just, I, I feel like the, from the privileged position that we have here with the resources in the business school to not tackle some of the pressing practical problems that our society is facing, and you know, we've seen a, a number of people uh, allude to this. Jane had talked about it in her uh, opening remarks, and some of, the, some of the research talks also address some of these topics. But you know, the world is full of problems, and I think POS has a unique uh, perspective to be able to help solve those problems. And I think that there's a real hunger and, in the field for this type of research. And uh, I don't think that they're, uh, you know, building off of, of what Jody was just saying, is I don't think there has to be a tension between doing good theoretically uh, rich research and doing research that makes a difference uh, in the world. Um, back when I was an associate editor at AMJ, we had a special issue on grand challenges. Uh, and we got so many submissions and so much interesting uh, work 
uh, for that special issue. So, I mean, there are people that are, are doing these things, and I think, uh, you know, the types of papers that we published, and, you know, one of my favorites that I edited was this uh, paper on the psychology of war, which, uh, you know, had people embedded in Afghanistan to, to collect this data and really brought kind of uh, the human experience to what it was like uh, to go through war, which, I mean, we, we talk about in our, our discourse, and it's, it's just so abstract and removed from anything uh, that at least I've, I've, I've done in my life, and that was so... You know, and, and on top of that, making a very rich theoretical contribution. Um, so there's not there's not this 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 tension between doing something that matters and doing something uh, that's theoretically rich. I think the two mutually enforce each other because you find yourself in situations that press you to rethink conventional knowledge and push you to really want to articulate uh, and express the voices of the people. Uh, that you're that you're studying. So there's a lot of motivation uh, to get the story right there and to get the story that impacts there. So I'd encourage people to um, think more about a problem-solving orientation and realize that for every theoretic, theoretical contribution you can make, you also have the opportunity to illuminate a context that we might not understand otherwise, as well as make a difference in the world. And I know it already seems like the bar for a theoretical contribution is pretty high, so I'm not trying to say, you know, there's two more bars to add on on top of that, but I think you can hit all three because they're going to build off of each other. So I especially love um, the point about studying positively deviant cases. I think they're so motivational in helping us to see what's possible. Because I think sometimes we get mired in those grand challenges and it's hard to dig out. And then it's wonderful to see a story. I'm going to go back to Christy again, just because she's a, it's a wonderful story, but it's also one that we all have in common. And who would guess that these women in prison would be talking to CIOs and CEOs and having the confidence and the, and the, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, skills, the training, the investment to be able to make that happen. It shows us what's, po what's really possible. Um, and then Scott, the, the second issue about tackling these pressing problems I think is really important. And I'm glad to see in our field now that people are um, not only publishing, you know, in the academic journals, but also thinking about the translations and even things like the, you know, the daily HBR online things that are coming out. They're on a range of really interesting topics, and it's kind of getting our stuff out in the world in a way that allows it to make a difference. So wonderful job staying on time with great content and substance, so that's wonderful. Um, I told them we would give them an opportunity if they had any reactions as they listened to each other. Maybe they don't agree with each other, or maybe something somebody said sparked a new idea for them. Um, so I'll, I'll open up the floor to the four of them to see if they wanted to respond at all. Well, I'll just ask Andrew, I'm kind of curious. So are bots going to be replacing us in the classroom too? And are we also going to be outsourced? <laughs> That's I don't on all your minds, right? <laughs> yeah. But you, I mean, you could imagine a world in which some of our work is at least partially, uh, I mean, it already is. Parts of research that today we do with the push of a button once we're done by hand. And it's not that far-fetched to imagine a world in which some of our uh, what we view as the creative production is done, um, is done algorithmically. Uh, if you think about the creation of poetry today or music uh, through algorithms, how far off is it until we can, uh, we can generate knowledge using, uh, using more advanced technologies? Uh, it's a little frightening to think about. Um, but if you imagine what your workplace is like today, what, what are some of the roles that you could imagine would be um, would be replaced. I mean, I can think of some in my own university, places where in the past we may have had people who did a lot of the grant development work and facilitating um, uh, and making contributions uh, to grant development that today are done entirely by, uh, by computers. Uh, and that's, there's also a sense of loss there, that you're losing these people who had made valuable contributions, and it's being replaced by something that you don't feel a connection to whatsoever. And I think that's why it's an intriguing transfer in, in the workplace is sometimes people are moving out, but new people aren't coming in to replace those, those individuals. Well, I was uh, just thinking of one example in our own areas um, in business schools is I've heard that there is some technology now to help with grading. I mean, I'm not just talking about the Scantron multiple choice, but that actually can do like yeah. a first shot at like an essay 
and providing feedback. And that's kind of interesting. So I, I, I was sharing with Gretchen earlier, I taught a, a, a new uh, people analytics course this past year. And as one of the components of the course, uh, we created a data set where we use computer vision in the classroom to provide feedback to students on, on class participation, uh, as, well as, as well as engagement in the classroom. And so that is something that today we rely on humans to do. And it was a very- Are we doing that with them right now? I don't know. I'm noticing a few people <laughs> are looking a little up. sleepy. <laughs> yeah, testing heart rates. <laughs> But that's something that today we trust human judgment. And you step back and you say, we widely acknowledge the biases that humans have in assessing one another's contributions. Uh, at what point do we no longer trust the human judgment and instead we're deferring uh, to the technology? I think that's an interesting place in thinking about the interpersonal ripple effects. Yeah. Yeah, that was one thing I wanted to reflect on as well, because yesterday I was teaching a group of um, surgeons and about relational coordination at the end, I said, can you see yourself being this kind of leader? Can you see your organization supporting you in this kind of leader? And there was a lot of interesting responses, but one was, um, do you think artificial intelligence will help us not have to do this? <laughs> <laughs> because not will we then be, will be, not have to be do, do relational, relational leaders and relationally coordinate with each other because uh, we might be instead coordinating with and through huh. uh, machines or algorithms. Yeah. Um, and the kind of consistent with the paper I just uh, read as well that artificial intelligence could hold the system's knowledge that I call shared knowledge. Um, that will help us have, that helps us kind of make the right judgments in this situation because we can see the, the, the picture, we understand who's doing what and why and, and when. So if the artificial intelligence, the algorithm is holding that system's knowledge, maybe it's, we're really being told when and what to coordinate rather than being the one that has to have the big picture. And I, I didn't know how to answer, that was a tough one. But it definitely reminded me of my original study of the airlines where as I interviewed ramp workers at say Southwest and American, the thing that um, the big takeaway at American was the ramp workers would say, well, I said, tell me what you do. We wait till the bell rings. We go out, we offload and unload the baggage and we come back and wait for the next bell. At Southwest, it's like, okay, when this is our job. We place the bags in this way because it matters for weight and balance. And we give this kind of information to the pilots because it matters for how the settings are, uh, you know, controls are set for takeoff and landing. And basically what we do is very important and we know exactly why. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different way to make sense of the same job. One was kind of a kind of robotic mm -hmm. bell rings, and we do this. Mm -hmm. We don't think too much about why, um, and that got you know captured in this relational coordination metric of do people, um, and it really seemed to be a predictor of performance. Um, at, at least the statistics say RC is driving some of these outcomes, and it seemed to be because people understand what they're doing and why, and they can adapt on the fly when something changes. Can a robot do that? I don't know. And if so, what does it do for the meaning of the work? Mm -hmm. um, and can we preserve that? These are questions rather than answers. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm just uh, throwing this out there because, I mean, these conversations, no matter what the technology is, will have been circulating. This is not new, mm -hmm. the question in terms of like, what, what, what about us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to be human? And, and what is it, how can we use technology? I think what POS can do, and, and also I, I, I would not be so afraid of the normative piece. As you were mentioning with the P, <laughs> there, there must be some kind of way to sort of say, you know what, here we know certain things mm -hmm. about what makes mm -hmm. us thrive and technology can help us with this and we're not going to just stand back and study the effects and sort of say, all right, here it went really poorly <laughs> and here it didn't. But I think where, where's the guidance coming, I think, into this conversation? I think that's where the research mm -hmm. can help and, and I would say we must be much more out there in the conversation on how to inform, how to use these, how to develop the protocols how to develop technological in innovation overall, what are the conversations that you want to have, and, and legitimize those conversations. Because I think we're, I, I'm just being provocative, I think we're oftentimes sitting back and then watching it unfold, mm -hmm. at the traditional academic conversation at mm -hmm. least, and say, okay, there's a neat case study of the sh space shuttle failing. Okay, good, fine. There's this, this is failing. Okay, good, we can use this for instruction. But I think we, we ha have to do more. And, and I'm not sure where and how this can be done, 
but I think opening up the conversations about some normative uh, uh, questions and concerns, and I, I just throw out the dignity piece, <laughs> there needs to be an understanding that we as humans are intrinsically valuable, not just instruments to yeah. be replaced yeah. by some kind of technology, et cetera, yeah. Yeah. and then start from there, how can the technology still be helpful and enable thriving, right? I think that's where POS has a unique position, and I'm not sure that the conversation is is there with the courage that I think is, uh, the virtuousness that, that I think that, that needs to be there. We need to be out there and have the conversations and be, be asking these kind of questions. I, I feel that's just sort of a reaction that I have to, to that one. And well, and maybe that's a, a good segue to um, the opening question I want to put to the group. And remember, in just a few minutes, we're going to be coming to you. To be, so be thinking about your questions or your ideas about where you think um, POS needs to be going. But my question for you um, as a group is how can we best work together as a research community to maintain and strengthen this research momentum? So we've had this conference right now. Um, we have some special issues. Those are all kind of the traditional ways that you know, we can build a research community. But what other pathways are out there that we should be thinking about, maybe there's something about technology, or you know, you brought up this normative piece, maybe there's some way that we need to be um, uh, supporting each other on more of an everyday basis than, rather than these you know, kind of incremental things. But you, you probably have some great ideas. How can we support each other to do high quality work? I'll just kind of uh, jump in. I, I, I think there are so many wonderful practices uh, that the POS community does that try and um, exemplify the research that we're doing. And so, you know, part of my answer is, you know, we're, we're, we're doing pretty well with this. Um, but like, you know, you know fostering, you know, sm smaller communities and the micro communities, uh, building up a shared identity with uh, you know, relationships with people who are working on, on similar work, uh, creating a safe environment where people are not afraid to truly present um, their unfinished product, uh, and then in turn they get really, really amazing feedback. Uh, a number of papers uh, that were presented uh, yesterday on, on gratitude, I think that's something that um, us as a field also don't collectively do much. Do, do much in terms of you know thanking people for the for the work that they've done. Uh, we all know what it takes to get a, a paper published, uh, and then on top of that, to get it cited and then even read. Maybe uh, I mean there's it's quite a, quite a uh. quite a narrowing funnel there. Uh, so you know when was the last time you you went up to, to someone whose whose work you had read and used and really admired and, and gave them a, a genuine uh, expression of gratitude? Uh, I think those things are, are deeply important uh, to people who have uh, to all of us. Um, so I think you know, just continuing to try and role model the behaviors and the activities that we're doing. And that also goes for uh, when we're reviewing papers, too, and remembering that, that same sense of you know, trying to find uh, you know, what might be positive in, in someone's paper, even if it's not quite there, mm -hmm. and realizing that uh, you're, you know, part of your role as a reviewer is to evaluate, but it's also to develop and foster. And ask yourself, are you really doing that, or is it really just about trying to get those six points out there on the paper to... Uh, to look like you did a good job for the editor. I mean, what's ultimately the purpose of, of what you're doing? Have you ever, you know, have you thought about that? So I, I would just say uh, stick to uh, many of the practices that we're, that we're uh, looking at in terms of our scholarship, uh, and I think we'll go a long way at uh, continuing to, to cultivate uh, a, a great place to, to really thrive in our research. I'll just build on that uh, and then add something new. Um, I think one way to sum up what you're saying is it's really important to be the change you wish to see in the world and uh, role model that. And it's not only true, I think, in our community, but that's also a really major principle of, of social change. Um, and that kind of gets back to the multi-level where it's what we do as individuals that makes our actions credible and um, have more of a ripple effect than if we're saying one thing and doing something completely different. And we learn this as parents very early on. It's what we do more than what we say that influences how our kids will learn to be um, good people in the world. Um, but I think that uh, I would also uh, say that this notion of a species consciousness, and we've heard it here, it's also part of the, the work of Marx that we are, if, if we could get to the point of having a species consciousness rather than just our individual, our family, our community, our country, um, it, that 
if, if, if Marx were alive, he'd probably say that's the key to human sustainability, is that, uh, which is, a, a, um, I think this, this small but growing movement within Paz and elsewhere on human sustainability is a really positive thing that we can do in this community to get to some of these big questions. And it kind of cuts across maybe all the things that we've said, but um, that human well-being, as you said, is not just kind of a means to an end, but it's, it, 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 it deserves to be an end in itself. Mm -hmm. Some of the mo really successful companies, um, and I studied Southwest, um, and about to start studying a, a kind of outlier pharmaceutical company, family owned, et cetera, that hold them up because um, one of their mantras is, we're gonna do the right thing and the profits will follow. As opposed, so treating people in the right way should be an end in itself and, and be conducive to, um, so human sustainability can lead to other kinds of sustainability, but really elevating that as a good um, in itself. That's something I think that PAUSE is uniquely positioned to do as a research community. I, I love the system change, the social change, the metaphor, and I think that maybe for a moment, if, if we can think about use, moving the research out of the conversation <laughs> mm. and just seeing ourselves as human beings, yeah. as a community, I think if we start connecting with other humans that are not necessarily doing the research, mm. but are completely aligned, I think that if, if I throw out a provocative number, 99% of the people want to thrive, right? Mm. The other ones maybe psychopathics, they, they, they thrive on, on undermining. But if we just take that number or any other number, the vast majority of people is an ally. So how can we use that as a possible platform to say, okay, this is, mm -hmm. they want the research maybe, they live the research, they can be connected with it. They can also be part of the scaling it up uh, if, if that's what is wanted. Mm -hmm. I would want that, <laughs> I would mm -hmm. throw this out. And to, in terms of partnership and momentum, I can just share two examples quick, quickly because it's uh, fascinating to me, but uh, we use the term dignity and well-being. Well-being is clearly the, the ultimate goal for, for our group. It's so aligned with this, but uh, this is the basic conversation of all spiritual traditions. So the Pope actually recently, we, we are working with the Vatican and that may be just one initiative, but it's more on the teaching front mm. because they say we need to completely shift what the narrative is in business schools particularly mm -hmm. um, because it does not allow <laughs> any of the, the, the principles that they're espoused to, to flourish, to, to be uh, enacted. And so they're working with Jesuit universities, then Catholic universities, all kinds of universities to sort of figure out how can we shift the narrative in the teaching conversation, it's the teaching conversation. Um, I think the research conversation must influence this, and I think you've, POS has a lot of this uh, already. Um, so I, I just want to throw this out as an example because there are so many more groups out there that want to be involved. And I'm just getting a text from a colleague of mine who is working with Richard Branson just now on his island or whatever. They're doing the same kind of thing. They're trying to do the same kind of thing. They're doing it from their angle, right? And so I think I can see there are lots of people that are doing the same kind of thing. If, if there was a way to just weave the web and, and, and do this with intention and do the kind of amazing research that's happening, I think there could be a lot of, of new uh, generative momentum. And that's just, uh, I don't know how to do it exactly, but mm -hmm. I'd be super excited to, to see some of this conversation going. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Uh, just one quick one. I felt a lot like Scott in, in thinking about, so when I saw this question in the slide, I was uh, felt completely ill-equipped to answer a question when I look at the community that you, that, that folks here have built, uh, and it's tremendously inspirational to think about the work that's gone into build such a vibrant community mm -hmm. already. Uh, and I think if there are one place that I would be, be uh, intrigued to, to learn more is how is it that junior folks and PhD students find this community? What's the entry point to this community? Um, and how can doctoral students especially find the community more quickly? Because it seems like this is a, a place that offers more resources, support, and value to folks at that stage in their, uh, in their training and, and profession. And so ramping that up more quickly, I think, would be, would be one place to strengthen the community for the future. And um, just as a, a little bit of um, kind of what's, what's next. First of all, I would say it's about we, not they. That we collective are the 
community. And the second piece is uh, we do have another touch point in August at the Academy of Management, and there are a lot of POS-related um, sessions there. The pre-conference that you guys are putting on on Thursday, um, is it still open? Yeah, for, yeah, it's still open. Still open for yeah. registration, and then our POS gathering, annual PS, POS gathering, and before you say, oh, I've got something else at that same time, I'll just remind you it's 7.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. <laughs> sleep. So I don't know what else you have at that time, but there's no good excuse why. Um, and we do provide breakfast, and it always is very um, uh, energizing. So with that, I promised you, gosh, you guys are so amazing, uh, that we would do about 15 minutes at the end for open um, questions and discussion with you. Um, there are these super, Jake has a super cool cube that has a microphone in it. He'll, he'll, he'll lob it to wherever, no. I mean, he can, but um, if you have a question or a, a thought about where you think that POS research needs to go, he will give you, he will give you the mic. So first of all, thank you, all of you. It was fabulous. And Andrew, your last point is like hit what the question I wanted to ask. I wondered if any of you have examples from your own um, social groups that you're part of or you created or examples that you've seen of how we could scale um, developmental support of uh, junior people, uh, PhD students, postdocs, junior faculty, because um, I think it's absolutely mission critical in the next two to three years. I'm completely, even now I have time retired to think about this, I'm really, I don't know where to go. So if you have any examples of things, institutions you've seen where they've scaled rapid development of young people with, that's more than access, because it's sort of like, what do you do once you've got access, you know? So anyway, any, any reflections any of you have, I would really appreciate hearing. So there, there are two other, two, two other communities that I'm a part of where I've seen efforts to engage doctoral students um, as well as to engage people more at scale. And so, for example, uh, the Research Methods Division of the Academy of Management now does a web-based consortium. And the intention behind that was to make it available to people who did not have the financial resources to travel uh, to the academy each year, but to still give them uh, the resources, the mentorship, and the guidance uh, in a way that they were able to access. Uh, the other community that I think makes a very active effort at bringing uh, doctoral students into the community uh, is in-group, which focuses on groups and teams. Uh, and one very simple thing that they do is they subsidize the conference fee for doctoral students. Mm. And so uh, faculty members pay more and, uh, and doctoral students pay less. And the reason behind that is explicitly to encourage, invite, uh, and, and motivate doctoral students to, to be a part of the community. Great. I'll share an example from the Relational Coordination Research Collaborative, or maybe two things that we strive to do. Uh, one is a, a monthly webinar slash cafe that we do online through Zoom, and it really brings together um, junior researchers, doctoral students, and practitioners who are really interested in the same thing, um, creating and sustaining relational positive relational dynamics in the workplace. Um, some, uh, and so that is, that's pretty scalable uh, because you don't have to be co-located. Um, a second thing is to take a, this analytic method that has become part of the research and the practice, I call it relational coordination analytics, and um, it's, yeah, I can do a seminar on it um, with students who are there at Brandeis, but starting next year, we're hoping to make it more of an online course so, because it's, it's hard to scale things when, especially at the beginning when there aren't enough people who know how to do something that suddenly a bunch of people want to do. So I think creating some of those online resources and still keeping the, them, uh, the relational networks that, that, that make them uh, sticky and not just mm -hmm. impersonal. Mm -hmm. um, at least we're experimenting with that. But I, I always see that what uh, Michigan has done with the kind of training doctoral students to go out in the world. I mean, I still see you as one of my best examples um, of, uh, of how to do this. And, um, you know, you do it so well. And I think if there's any way we can make it even more scalable through 
technology interfaces. That's great. And the Humanistic right. Management Society also has a, yeah. a doctoral student. Right. We do have a, a, a virtual community virtual. of yeah. doctoral students that's dedicated. They have a career development piece to it. They have a reading group uh, that just developed. And it's all just emerging. So I'm, I'm just sharing that as it's an emergent property. But the way that we do it with the intentionality that it actually propagates itself so that we don't have to do much of the control thing, that they do it. They get the, the support through the Zoom but then it's basically they have their time zone. They can do it their way. They, mm -hmm. they get the model, but it's not hard of a model, I think. And, and much of the, the, the stuff that is done here, the way that you can convene communities, I think if that's be a taught and disseminated, it can be scaled rather quickly. So I'd love to have more of that conversation mm -hmm. just because I think there's a big need. And there's one more example out in the room. Awana, uh, maybe not super scalable, but really a deep dive. Do you want to just take one minute to say what you do with doctoral yeah, students? We believe in multipliers. So we just started a regenerative organizing community that we scaled to 18 countries as of March. I think there are multiple models, um, and I'm happy to lend my time and energy to anybody who wants to do work in the space there. We know all the designs that work. All of them have been deeply relational, and I think with some innovative ways and tools uh, to recruit that AI as an ally, maybe we can scale more rapidly. I don't have the knowledge of how to do that virtually, but I can unpack the designs and, and, and work with people who know how to scale it virtually. Um, so as the next person gets their hand up, I would just uh, put out two, thing, two additional things. One is, if you've got great undergraduate or MBA students, encourage them to consider an, a PhD. I don't know how many students mm. that I hear saying it was because one person said, mm. I think mm. you would be a really great professor, a really great researcher. And then I'm going to go back to Christy one last time. And um, you know, her example of, I want to do this really wild and crazy thing that's going to you know, be my dissertation. And some advisors would say, no, no. Do something more simple and safe, and that, but in your case, you had encouragement, and so I would also say, let's encourage our graduate students to think to think big. All right, there's another question someplace. Yes. Actually, it's not a question. I just I felt like as you guys were discussing this, as a doctoral student, I just have to weigh in and say thank you. Um, there are so many people here who have reached out to me and I know to other doctoral students here and who are doing all of these things and it is working and there are a lot of us here today and we are very, very grateful for this community. So thank you all. All right, where's, where's the next question? Or, or observation. Or observation. <laughs> There's one down here. <laughs> You're getting your steps in. Who's, who's got it? Right here. It's um, okay. not much of a question, but maybe an announcement. Because, like, just talk, like, on a note of, like, you know, helping doctoral students, I struck up a conversation with a few doctoral students during this lunch, and we thought about, you know, like we should talk to each other more, right? So we thought about like gathering at um, this year's academy over lunch or something. So I have a list of few people that we want to get together. So if you want to be part of the lunch doctoral student meeting, like who, you know, as a way of like reconnecting and building more community, please come to me at the end of Today's closing, I can write down your name and maybe reach out and we'll get together very soon. So I will add that to the end of the survey you'll be receiving um, that will ask for your feedback about the conference. There will be a field where you can put your email it, or the email of a doctoral student who you think would like to be connected to UNVIT for that doctoral student community. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right, La last okay. chance. Let's, do we have another hand? Yes. Jake, all the way in the <laughs> back oh, corner too. again. I think Sandra, too. I have a loud voice sometimes. He, he, Jake has a good arm, too. I'm going to try and toss it. Hello? Yeah. 
Well, I'm interested in Andrew's and Michael's reaction to this just a bit around the view of a, what's going to happen as there's more AI and more, more robotiz robotization, if that's the word. Um, I learned this idea that the f there was a farming in the United States, 25% of the people were employed in farming and they thought, oh my God, if we stop automate farming, everybody's going to be unemployed. Yeah. They said the same thing around ATMs, that uh, there'd be, as we have auto tellers, that there's going to be nobody working in banking and that's actually, there's many, many more people providing services and stuff like that. So what I can, and same thing, like if you think of music, how many people were in music and now everybody's making music and entering and there's, you know, into YouTube or there's a hundred ways to kind of enter into music and even academia, if we look at it, I don't know for sure, but there's more and more virtual learning, more and more online learning. Do we actually have less percent of students and, you know, in the learning world globally or more and more people rising up into the second class, in the middle class? Um, so what I'm thinking is, you know, 40% of the people, the jobs might get eliminated. That's 60 up here working, 40 down here not working. But it's possible that a good half or more of that 40 will kind of elevate up into providing higher and higher degrees of services. More and more people are buying more and more services and so on. Um, so my question is kind of, and more and more people are buying more and more things and paying money. And we just, the whole economy is transacting on many, many more levels that what would your guys, and then we, this is my kind of main point, is that Taylorism way back when uh, as one way of looking at how to improve jobs and improve the workplace and theory X and Y, and now we're doing all this amazing analysis around how people interact in the workplace, and so our work is further elevating what leadership means and how good quality relationships should exist, and more and more companies are hiring coaches and trainings and stuff like that. So the white collar world is continuously um, uh, buying more and more and getting hopefully better and better at running organizations and solving problems to, I think, Michael's point, solving these big world problems. There'll never be any end to world problems. So do you think we're going to have mass unemployment? Or do you think we're going to have better and better organizations doing a better job of solving more of world's problems? You know, and so then we need, Andrew, do we need to get used to working with, uh, with AI or do, are we just going to be getting better and better and better working with each other, utilizing AI, using computers and every method of automation possible to make our world a better place? So I'd like to think it was a very optimistic future. What are your thoughts? <laughs> so, so I think, I mean, connected, connected to the idea and the importance of looking at organizations as systems, uh, if we think about many of the technologies today that are being implemented, they are designed to do fairly discrete functions. And so, as a result, they are not designed with a systems perspective. And so if we introduce into an EHR in a hospital, if we introduce these diagnosis uh, assistance algorithms, uh, we're not thinking necessarily about the ripple effects through the system of, of the introduction of that one component. And I think that's what, uh, what I find more to be the space for the organizational scientists to contribute is in thinking about the interpersonal and organizational ripple effects of putting these things in place that start to come closer and closer to mimicking the parts of us that we think are, that we think are uh, most human. And so imagine call centers today. We all get robocalls. Uh, robocalls are going to increasingly be skilled uh, in mimicking human emotion and responding to human emotion. You know, what does that do? What does that do? How do we then transfer our interaction with this pseudo-human to our truly human coworkers? Uh, do we start to build new routines of behavior that are okay when we're interacting with something that's not truly human, uh, but then we transfer that and project that to something that is or someone who is uh, truly human? So I think those are, to me, those are the more uh, the the questions that are riper for POS rather than the the impact on percentages of employment and, and, and unemployment. Michael, do you have any final thoughts? I think this is just such a big topic and it's an ongoing topic. It's just shifts in the technology. I feel what you're mentioning, that this uh, that needs to be an outreach to the groups that actually make these decisions <laughs> and, and that there is a way to have this conversation with folks. I don't think the, the metrics is unemployment, not unemployment. The kind of employment, the kind of work, the kind of things, the kind of future that you can create with it, I think that should be the, the intentionality of that conversation. And I think that 
that's, that's up to us. If we just sit back and then do the kind of fear thing, as we're currently seeing in the narrative of the press, it's all fear-based, uh, then, then we're going to lose. And I think we're losing in, on, on many fronts if we're doing that. And to create the mechanisms to help people make good transitions right. and be resilient as things are shifting in dramatic yeah. ways. Yeah. We have to create holding environments for them to be able yeah. to um, thrive amidst those changes. So, yeah. And, and if we're going to have um, successful multi-level systems change that really is, um, leads to human sustainability, uh, I think we've got to be very attentive that it is a multi-stakeholder process and that some of the stakeholders who are, don't have a lot of power and a lot of voice have to be incorporated into the process. And just as we've learned to do that to some extent in organizations, we're going to have to learn how to do that at a more, um, uh, a, a high, the level of, of our, our societies. Um, so noticing and empowering the stakeholders to be part of the conversation so they don't get left out into that kind of um, uh, the neglected portion of the population that doesn't benefit from some of these um, uh, changes that could be positive if they were inclusive. And I would just, just say, like, the, the undertone of this whole thing is, you know, who's actually programming the algorithms and how are they going to interact mm -hmm. with us? I mean, there's a lot of choices that can be made, and ho hopefully those choices uh, will create a more positive workplace. Well, that will have to be the final wor word. Thank you so much for an inspiring uh, a viewpoint on the future. And um, I hope it, it enhanced the ideas that you originally wrote down at the beginning of this session. So with that, please give a very warm thank you to our panel. Thank you. Nice work. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Gretchen.